Hey, so welcome back. Uh, and so for those that are just joining, every episode I, I interview a new guest that gives us some big insights for our own small business. And so we have some raw and real conversations with guests that give us tactical advice that we can actually apply. And so in this case, I wanted to have a chat with Andrea Bartlett because honestly, a lot of small businesses are struggling with, right now with their HR. And so she's been with uh, Humi for a while in a key position. And so we also love working with Humi as well. And so she's come across very pragmatic uh, with practical solutions to people management in a way that's actually pretty refreshing. And so we chatted a little bit about some uh, metrics, uh, keeping connected with the staff as you grow your business, some good inexpensive ways to keep an awesome employee culture, and some of the biggest mistakes that she's seen in small business owners uh, in their HR. And so let's listen up and let's jump in. they have insight into the performance of the business truly is the best way to ensure that you are not overspending or spending on the wrong things. You're busy. We know. We cut through the BS and give you straight talk advice whether you're a seasoned entrepreneur or just starting out. Our small business Big Insights podcast dives straight to the point on key topics and features interviews with industry experts and successful small business owners who share their deep insights. Tune in each month to gain new ideas and inspiration for your own small business. So welcome to the Small Business Big Insights podcast. We, uh, we're so excited to have uh, on this episode today some big insights from a very special guest, Andrea Bartlett who helps us with a pragmatic approach to managing people for your small business. And I invite you right now to follow our, our episode on your provider of choice, or you'll miss out on some upcoming episodes. Uh, also, give us a review if you can to help uh, spread the message. So today, we've got Andrea Bartlett. So Andrea has been the Vice President of People at Humi, uh, which is Canada's leading HR, payroll, insurance, and benefits software solution for small and medium-sized businesses. And she's also acted as an expert in residence at the DMZ Startup Incubator in Toronto, where she uses a pragmatic approach to navigate through difficult decisions in order to drive engagement, retention, and, of course, growth. She is basically obsessed with all things related to people and loves to solve problems through a people-focused lens. The COVID-19 pandemic has taught her the importance of enabling people by playing on their strengths and to essentially allow for navigating change. She, she brings an approach in leading people and sees herself as a natural change agent, a people manager, and an advocate for employee experience. Over the pandemic, while people were huddling inside and taking it easy, uh, she, of course, decided to do her Ted Rogers MBA with the Toronto Metropolitan University, and she's a very proud alumni. So we're very lucky to have Andrea with us today. Thank you so much. Thank you for having me. Let's, let's get straight into it. So what do most small business owners underappreciate about the employee experience? Well, employee experience is this term that I would kind of equate it to what culture was five years ago. You know, it's a very hot topic. Everybody's using the term. You're seeing organizations move away from saying human resources and focus on people and people experience and definitely employee experience. And so it's easy to overcomplicate something that has already existed. I think that most small businesses get in their own head that employee experience has to be this grandiose thing that has a lot of you know, time, focus, and people behind it. But the fact is employee experience is the way in which people are interacting, the way that they're coming together and socializing, the way that they're mm -hmm. solving problems, and the way that they're communicating. You see that in businesses through an onboarding experience, a recruiting experience, through the way feedback is given, mm -hmm. through, again, the way that you're coming together to collaborate, to socialize. And at the end of the day, whether or not you're choosing to formally invest in your employee experience, the choice not to focus on it is still a choice. Um, I have worked with businesses where you're sitting around a kitchen table, you're bringing your own laptop and you're trying to build something from scratch on your own. And the way that we would prioritize what we're working on, the times that we would work together, the way that we would set boundaries, and the way that we would socialize 
was part of that employee experience. And you start to learn through the business leaders what kind of employee experience matters to them. Maybe they have a heavy emphasis on coming together, collaborating, and the socialization component of that. Maybe other leaders are much more process-driven and really like to make sure that things are in order and that people have access to information right from the get-go. Mm. Um, as an example, actually, I will never forget one of the best pieces of advice that um, my, my mentor um, once shared with me when I, when I joined Humi. Um, he said, listen, Andrea, you're joining a growing business. You are joining a scale up and we are less focused on process because we want you to build out what employee experience looks like, but don't be alarmed if in the very beginning stages, you're feeling like you have less on the go because no matter what, it's a small business, we are growing and it will get chaotic. And guess what? Two months in, I had never been more thankful because I actually had time to digest and to learn nice. and to meet people yeah. in the early stages where those relationships are starting to form to build trust and you know it makes working together and solving problems easier. So mm -hmm. if I were to say that in one sentence, the biggest thing that uh, small business owners do when it comes to employee experience is uh, overcomplicating the fact that um, employee experience is the choice and way in which you bring people together, whether you're choosing to do that formally or not. Mm -hmm. And, and I, and I love how you talked about like just setting the expectation from the beginning and like just being upfront with like a new employee as like, look, this is mm -hmm. the situation. This is what you're going to run into. Like, you know, kind of, this is what the job description said. Here's the, like the lowdown so that there's kind of like no kind of like disconnect. Right. Um, and, and you're talking exactly. about kind of like startups and how, you know, in startups, there's a little bit more, I guess, fluidity to to kind of that job description. And so I guess, you know, startups really well, you know, the small business owner kind of world um, who, you know, barely have money to even hire employees sometimes. How how are they supposed to kind of provide a really good employee experience without it costing lots of money? Like, how does that mm -hmm. reconcile? Mm -hmm. Well, Again, every single person that you choose to hire in a business, um, whether it, you're a business of two, whether you're a business of 150, um, in the early stages, as you're smaller, every hire is bringing in that specific subject matter expertise that you need in order to achieve X goal that you have as a business owner. Mm. And so ways in which you can create that employee experience early on generally start with the conversation that you're having when you're trying to bring people in. Is it through your network? Um, is it a family friend? Um, you know, is it a, a person that you play sports with um, and one of their connections um, that you're looking to bring on as an intern? Typically the smaller stage and earlier mm -hmm. stage of a business, it's completely hiring through your network. Right. Um, very much reliant on trust, and I don't think that many employees have the expectation that you are going to have this robust onboarding process where you're learning. But again, leveraging technology that you have, um, at least giving an overview to the employee of the people that are there, what their first week might look like, what kinds of tools you use. I hear all the time people having a lot of anxiety of is the company G Suite or Microsoft because right. there's such a big difference between yeah. the tech stack and your day-to-day -day work. Mm -hmm. um, the approach that uh, we took at Humi was certainly to give information ahead of time to reduce anxiety because it's already Interesting. stressful enough when you are joining a new place and you don't mm -hmm. know anybody within the organization. What do you, do you so put that would, like on the job description? Like how do you give them that information yeah, ahead of time. Yeah, you can. So in the job description, it starts with outlining what are the stages of the interview process, right? Nobody yeah. likes to know or nobody likes to have this great sense of mystery. So yeah. typically at the bottom, it would include this application process will include a phone screen, a technical assessment and a culture interview and then final offer. Mm -hmm. And so that helps reduce anxiety while also building employee experience. Mm -hmm. Once somebody joins the organization before their first day, typically we would send, again, you can build this in Word, in PowerPoint. It doesn't have to be overly sophisticated, but 
we would include what does your first day look like? What are what are the paydays? Is it you know every other week? Is it semi monthly? What kind of tools do we use? Who are the five people that you would want to know in your role? Mm -hmm. And we took that approach. And then over time, of course, with more resources, more team members, we started to build that out into a formal onboarding program that took place over uh, three weeks time. Mm -hmm. Um, And again, starting small was the approach. Starting small, providing information and finding ways to make sure that we're keeping the lines of communication open to employees. Mm -hmm. And whether you have a tool like Humi that allows you to do that through an applicant tracking system, through an onboarding checklist or not, um, you still have ways that obviously you're communicating with new employees. Mm -hmm. Um, And in the early stages, less is less is more, Mm -hmm. or sorry, the opposite, more (laughs) communication is better. So you want to over communicate in the early stages. Yeah. Yeah. And it sounds like a lot of it is just setting the expectations and letting them know what you're going to do and like what their life is going to be like working with you and then actually following up after that. And hopefully you're saying mm-hmm. the truth so that like what ends up happening is what you told them was going to happen. And then you kind of build that trust, you know, so that's mm-hmm. uh, that's pretty big. Um, and, and I guess like building that trust kind of allows you to to kind of like basically foster a better relationship with your uh, your employees. And, and, and I think that Like, what is it that you think is the biggest mistake in that regard or the biggest kind of mistake that small businesses are doing as it relates to their employees? Um, I would say that small businesses, uh, this is going to be a little counterintuitive to what I just said, where you want to over communicate in the early stages. Okay. But there's also um, a common misconception that the more information you share, the better informed everybody is going to be. Mm. And I've sometimes seen that backfire and create a sense of distrust and impact the employee experience where employees become less engaged. And so what do I mean by that? Let's say in the early stages, you were getting together every single day. You had a morning team huddle every single day. Yeah. The company grows from three people to six people. Common rule of thumb is every time your team doubles, whether it's across the company, or maybe you are a department leader of, you know, customer experience team, and you go from having three people to six people in your department, you need to do an internal review and understand is the way that we are meeting and communicating and sharing information appropriate or not. Mm -hmm. And so as an example at Humi, it went from meeting different departments every single morning to then having a company-wide town hall. You hear about that all the time in growing, whether it's, you know, a scale up or growing business, you hear about town halls Mm -hmm. or all hands meetings. And what we found with Humi was that over time, as the business was growing, it was becoming very time intensive. And the information that was shared at these weekly company-wide meetings wasn't really driving impact to the employee level. And so we shifted as, again, the business doubled by employee base to monthly meetings and making sure that it was the same content every time. Again, talk about setting expectations. When we were smaller, when we were meeting more frequently, it was a little bit of the wild west in terms of what was gonna be shared and presented. Maybe it was talking about business strategy. Maybe you would have a review of the financials. Maybe you would have a conversation about product features that are changing. Mm -hmm. But by assessing how we were um, meeting internally, And how we were communicating what who the audience base was and making sure that there was consistency we got away from that um over sharing of information without having the dots be connected to the employees because at the end of the day the employees who are your audience might be sitting there asking why why am i hearing this why is this information relevant to me Mm -hmm. and so that over sharing when you are smaller is a common symptom of, uh, you know, being a very small business. And as leaders grow, they need to, they need to understand that not all people need to know all information at all times. Mm. And ultimately that does impact employee experience because it can create, you know, a sense of confusion, a sense of distrust. Um, It can also create very weird um, internal politics without even really realizing when people who you know know information aren't supposed to 
because maybe they were friends or they were part of the original team. Hmm. Um, And so those are all things that ultimately impact employee experience because at the end of the day, people want to know that they're joining a purpose-driven organization that can scale and that they are going to be, you know, given the opportunity to perform well and they're going to be evaluated fairly. But if there is a sense that, you know, there's other information being shared in ways that you have no control over, again, because of politics or because of history, um, it can make it very hard to actually build a culture that wins an experience that is, uh, that's balanced and really employee led. Interesting. Yeah. Cause like, I know, I know even just for our own kind of firm, we, we would meet up like every day, right? Like when we were kind of mm-hmm. smaller and then we kind of grew and, and what you're saying resonates a lot here where, you know, we, we started to cut out some of our, our regular meetings. So like now we don't chat on Fridays or things like that. And so now we have like different department meetings every day instead of like the whole team. Mm-hmm. And, and so there's, yeah. So it's really interesting that what you're talking about of like, oversharing can actually be a negative in some cases and uh, or even just sharing information with certain groups of people instead of everyone can kind of show a sense of like preference or you know politics in the workplace so um yeah that's interesting that seems like a yeah something that could definitely be happening for a lot of other small businesses so Mm -hmm. wow um and and i guess like you know we like to measure everything as I mean, I'm an accountant. I like to measure everything. Um, <laughs> how do you kind of measure some of the HR goals that you have for, let's say, employee engagement or or satisfaction? Mm-hmm. So uh, often used interchangeably, they typically, well, they're supposed to be um, driving at uh, different impact engagement compared to satisfaction. Okay. And so within Humi, uh, Humi has a employee survey tool which allows you to create uh, custom surveys um, and make them specific to employee engagement. So when we talk about engagement, that is the way in which people are motivated to do the work, the perception Mm. that they have around um, their manager's knowledge, their team's knowledge, the way that they're evaluated, the way that they are, um, you know, educated on what's going on within the business. Um, so that is engagement and then satisfaction similar, but it's the, how likely are you to recommend this organization? How is your work-life balance? How satisfied are you with the group benefits, the total compensation package? Mm. Um, how satisfied are you with, again, performance of your manager? Um, and so when you're measuring those things, you want a blend of both, uh, quantitative and qualitative information. Oftentimes, uh, we see clients that are sending out surveys that are yes, no answers, uh, or open-ended, uh, questions. Mm -hmm. And it's great to have that, uh, qualitative information because it gives more context. You Mm -hmm. can see a certain people or one individual's perspective. The even if a survey is anonymous, which Humi allows you to do, it can be dangerous because if you are a small business, if you've worked with folks long enough, I don't think I've ever worked with a leader who hasn't naturally tried to guess who the voice is of the survey results that they're reading. Yeah. Um, and so that is something to be aware of. But mm-hmm. at the same time, again, your ENPS data, your engagement surveys should also have Uh, rating questions, you know, on a scale of one to five or on a scale of one to 10 um, in order for you to understand, okay, beginning of the year, people ranked this, our group benefits as a six out of 10. Mm -hmm. That should tell you as a business that people don't think that your group benefits are competitive compared to other organizations. Again, if you were to change that halfway throughout the year, ideally you want to see that specific survey result increase if you're doing a rating question over time. So in the space of people management, you need both qualitative and quantitative Um, when you are building uh, and then to shift gears and talk about general HR metrics. Again, your, your HRIS tool is going to have different reporting infrastructure within it which is going to allow you to measure different things like time to hire within your applicant tracking system, um, your turnover, average tenure, um, your employee demographics, so age, uh, geography, 
Um, and that information is important based on where the business is looking to go. Mm -hmm. So I like to make sure that the team understands that, you know, there are certain things that we need to be vocal about when it comes to HR metrics, but HR metrics should often not be the leader of where the business is going, right? It needs to be, where's the business going? What are the business objectives? What is the information and reporting that we have on our people mm -hmm. and our HR programs and the usefulness of those programs? And then based on the goals of the business, adjust your HR planning. Interesting. Yeah. And I, I mean, there's also the, I don't know if you, I think it's Jim Collins who has the the whole thing about getting the right people on the bus before you go and drive <laughs> or whatever. So that kind of yeah. contradicts a little bit what you're saying of like, you know, <laughs> you need to have your business goals first and then kind of see who fits. And then I think Jim Collins is the one who said, you know, put every, put all the good people on the bus and then figure out where you want to go, you know? Mm -hmm. um, but that's interesting. Um, and I know like in the past, like, you know, you've talked about just from various sources that I've seen, you talked about how, uh, a people leader needs to make sure that employees play to their strengths, right? So you need to mm -hmm. figure out, you know, who's actually good at what and then kind of play onto that. And especially when someone's strengths uh, may not be in their job description, how how do you even do that for a small business, mm -hmm. right? Like practically speaking, how do you uncover people's strengths and, and lead that way? Mm-hmm. So I've seen some small businesses really uh, really invest in their recruiting process, for example. And I don't mean they don't always have a recruiter, they don't have an applicant tracking system, but they have a candidate evaluation tool okay. um, where they use that and really believe that that information is indicative of whether or not someone is going to succeed in that type of role in this business, sometimes sales roles, sometimes you know, technical roles. And so I've seen some small businesses actually heavily invest in technology in areas that allow them to see whether or not that candidate has the right um, competencies that they're looking for. It doesn't necessarily mean that, you know, they have all of the um, technical skills on the job description, but the way that they solve problems, the way that they communicate, um, the way that they move through um, escalating uh, and, and troubleshooting. And so some businesses will focus there. Um, and I guess I've also seen organizations who are really focused, who are focused on understanding not just their recruiting process, but are focused on understanding their onboarding process and how that maps out uh, people's strengths and weaknesses. And so, for example, with within Humi, once somebody joins um, the people team, mm -hmm. you go through and we use uh, we use Notion and we ask over fifty questions of oh, wow. Are you a morning or nighttime um, you know productive thinker? Do you like feedback real time? Do you like to respond right. on the spot or do you like to come back to that? And so what that does is it opens the door for that conversation. Okay. Oftentimes people's perception of themselves is going to obviously be different than the perception of people they work with, their manager. You know, there's all enough, uh, there's enough information and in articles on, you know, our natural self compared to our work self. And so again, the way you think that you act or work might not be the way that other people are perceiving that. And so that is an example of a way that you can understand people's strengths without having to invest in, um, a, in a tool. Cause ultimately what I'm talking about is asking questions. We mm -hmm. ask the same set of, again, almost 50 questions. Some of them are fun. Uh, you know, are you a cat or a dog person? <laughs> what, uh, what house would you be a part of in Harry yeah. Potter? So you get to know people <laughs> that way. Um, but then there's also what kind of um, communicator are you? You know, what kind of environment do you best work in? And these are all things, um, some of these things we ask in the interview stages, of course. Okay. But at the onboarding process, that's really where there's a deep dive to really create a blueprint for employees and people managers to understand what employees' perceptions of themselves are. And then that allows the people manager to choose to adjust or set a boundary and say, listen, you are productive in the morning. I am productive in the afternoon. 
here's how we're going to compromise. Hmm. You are a, a process focused person who needs time to digest. As a people manager, I respond on the spot. And so here's what I am going to do in order to accommodate the way that we work differently. Right. Um, again, it starts with a conversation. Hmm. Yeah. If the person wants to give feedback right away, it's like maybe they draft it now, but they'll schedule the yeah. email to go out later uh, yeah. or whatnot. Yeah. And I mean, documenting, I guess, people's preferences and as part of the onboarding, uh, you know, you have like you said, over 50 questions or whatnot. Does that does that help with, I guess, the personal touch even as you scale, um, because I've seen a lot of like smaller businesses that have great, you know, employee experience when they're smaller. Right. And then mm -hmm. as they grow, they become less in touch with each employee. They don't know, you know, the employees like spouses names and dogs names and kids names. Mm -hmm. and, and so, yeah, like how do you keep that personal touch as a business grows? Mm -hmm. Again, at the, at the onboarding stage, and I think there's there's a study that was done that um, you know if you lose your employee within the first ninety days, you have a seventy percent chance of losing your employee within the first ninety days if the onboarding experience is terrible. Right. Um, what terrible means <laughs> that it didn't talk about. So um, that's I guess uh, in the in the eye of each uh, employee. But um, ultimately it comes down to the way that you're choosing to invest in onboarding. And when I say invest, I mean, here's an example. When I joined um, actually any organization that I've worked with so far, it's been a mix of bring your own device or show up to the office, get handed your device, and then go figure out you know where you're sitting, who people are, things like that. Because again, right. I joined very smaller stage, yeah. uh, earlier stage, less people with the expectation that I would be part of the yeah, building. You're designing of what that. Like, yeah, exactly. It's not there yet. Exactly. Yeah. And so uh, Humi has some fabulous team members, um, one of which, um, her name's Tasha. She actually worked to completely overhaul the design of the onboarding experience that um, the original HR team member, Karen, had actually created. Mm -hmm. And so Karen had done a good job setting the foundation, um, you know, going through the org design, uh, the tech stack, talking about equity as a venture backed business and did a good job of having it, you know, both live. So um, done on the spot mm -hmm. as well as recorded sessions to kind of accommodate okay. uh, people's different learning styles. Hmm. Over time, the, our team member who her entire role is employee experience um, she redesigned the onboarding program, the length of time, the format, uh, the content, and also completely overhauled the onboarding kits. And so what used to be, you know, here's a laptop that's either getting shipped to you or given to you. Um, before you join, you were, get, you were getting sent a questionnaire that asks, you know, what's your favorite kind of snack? Um, it, we would send swag, um, we would send mindfulness cards. Mm. Um, everybody had the opportunity to set up their remote, uh, space, uh, within a, a budget that was given to them. Right. Um, she made sure that within the first week you have lunch with your manager. And so you have, um, either lunch delivered to you or Uber skip the dishes, um, gift card sent to you. And okay. so small touches but a way, again, going back to what we talked about earlier, setting expectations that new employees knew that they were getting an onboarding kit. They knew that it would have swag and they knew roughly what their first week was going to look like. Mm -hmm. um, and so really the personal touch came into how people filled out that survey. Mm -hmm. I think I said that I love, I love, um, cashews and beer nuts. And so I was really happy when I got, you nice. know, a tin of beer nuts. And, uh, and that was, you know, a personal touch that showed yeah. me that, okay, you're not just asking questions, you're actually doing something with the information. Right? Yeah, you're acting on your preferences, not just kind of like having a, a company wide policy, we send x, y, and z to every employee. It's kind of like, you know, we really care about your preferences. So that's, that's, mm -hmm. that's interesting. Even as like a big company, yeah, documenting it and making it part of the onboarding process, no matter how many employees you have, you can still have that personal touch. That's, that's mm -hmm. interesting. And I, yeah. I have seen some businesses that are, you know, have grown from 150 to six, 700 employees in the last few years. And 
again, it, it's leader dependent, but I see all over social media that this CEO is still making sure that once a quarter, they're doing a social with all new hires. So they're doing a virtual social where only new hires can attend and they just have, whether it's a coffee chat um, or they have you know a, a virtual game that they're playing with the CEO. Mm. And that CEO feels very important that they're connected in some way to all of the new hires. Yeah. Um, I've seen some CEOs block time so that they have coffee chats mm. for two hours a week and they're, they either choose at random and, you know, tools like Slack have great, uh, integrations with, I think it's called donut. So it randomly pairs you with people. Um, <laughs> oh, really? and so there's way, yeah, yeah. And so it's, it's, it's a good way you get asked prompt questions what's your favorite TV show? Um, what's your favorite flavor of dessert? That kind of thing. Just to Oh, so you get fill the out this rolling. whole thing and then it, it matches yeah, you and with someone else. It That's randomly matches yeah. you with somebody in the company that you <laughs> would otherwise have no reason to meet yeah. with. Cool. And so again, I've seen leaders have that protected calendar time to make sure that they're still reaching out to employees. Um, mm-hmm. As long as, again, as long as you're setting the expectation that it's a social conversation it's not going to evolve into talking about work or how you're feeling. Um, it's ultimately up to the business leader to understand how they prioritize knowing mm-hmm. everybody on the team, or as you said, have that personal touch that mm-hmm. equates to employee experience because every leader is going to be different. Mm-hmm. And I and I love how you're kind of explaining some examples here of like actually using technology tools or software to, to really help that employee experience, right? Like you've always been a big believer of the technology side to, to improve that. Mm-hmm. What, what do you think Humi does specifically to, to do that? In order to enable the employee experience? Yeah. Well, I'd say right out of the gate, um, the user experience and the branding okay. are pretty differentiated. Mm. So I, I'll never forget actually getting a message on LinkedIn from um, you know, a colleague from more than a decade ago who just reached out and said, I just want to call out the fact that Humi has a visible minority who is wearing a hijab in mm. their kind of, um, I don't, in their characters that are part of all of their branding. <laughs> um, okay. And so this individual said, you know, that made me feel really seen. Mm-hmm. Um, and I love the fact that that's something that Humi stands uh, stands by and is actively doing in the HIS space. Mm-hmm. Um, and so in terms of the how Humi is differentiated, to me, it starts right at that, that point. Um, the experience as a user is very intuitive. Um, the branding um, is very inclusive. Mm-hmm. And um, Humi holds itself to a high expectation of um, being inclusive as an HIS tool because mm-hmm. of, of its end users. And so whether it's Humi, whether it's other technology, yeah. um, at the end of the day, the, the intuitiveness is, um, is differentiated. Um, onboarding tasks that Humi has is something, again, that evolved very quickly at the beginning of the pandemic, but it's just a very easy way for both people managers and employees to understand and get reminded, oh yeah, shoot, I have to go do that thing. Okay, I have 30 days to do that. Mm -hmm. Um, And then when we transition over to people on the people team, um, the way in which that the onboarding process has been automated internally for Humi is something that I know that uh, actually people on my team have shared through webinars and have shared with other folks in the HR community. because both the experience and uh, our onboarding scores are extremely high for industry standards. Okay. And that's something that, um, you know, the team takes a lot of pride in. Okay. This episode of Small Business Big Insights is brought to you by ZenBooks. ZenBooks is a reimagined full service online accounting experience. I work at ZenBooks and we bring a fresh, unique and modern approach to a very old fashioned industry. We've been working remotely well before it was cool. And we're a team of advisors, accountants, and payroll professionals that provide ongoing impactful insights to small business owners and key decision makers. That means that we get into the nitty gritty of weekly calls 
with ongoing reporting, bookkeeping, payroll, tax filings, and tax planning. Even if you already have an accountant or a bookkeeper, or you have some accounting staff on your team, you should talk to ZenBooks about the tools and expertise that they have to offer. Check out ZenBooks at zenbooks.ca. Now let's get back to the episode. And, and I guess we can kind of flip this conversation to the opposite perspective of saying that, you know, some people worry that if you let HR professionals kind of lead an organization, you, you may end up overspending on salaries, overspending on benefits, and have really happy employees, but you're going to have an unprofitable business. And so what's the best way to kind of balance the people in your team, the clients, and profitability? Mm-hmm. That is a million dollar question, isn't it? <laughs> um, <laughs> I think that it really starts with, again, the leadership's approach to embracing the function of people, call it human resources, people and culture, uh, people operations, employee experience. Mm -hmm. It is easy to become siloed and spend money and work on exciting people programs and really create something that is very employee centric. But again, whether outside of the budget or doesn't align with the way that the business is moving, if leadership is not including HR, you hear all the time, you know, HR needs a seat at this table, this proverbial table. Um, Whether you have somebody formally in the seat of HR or not, the reality is you are employing people, you are spending money on salaries and benefits People have an expectation that they are going to be evaluated, that there's Mm -hmm. going to be performance and compensation conversations at some point. Mm -hmm. So I hear often that small businesses can't do, you know, XYZ HR initiative or people program because they don't have somebody that has, you know, the HR hat on. Mm -hmm. As an example, when I joined Humi, there were five different people wearing that proverbial HR hat. Oh, okay. Um, and it what you know, somebody was in charge of recruiting, another person was in charge of processing compensation and benefits, oftentimes your financial controller. Mm-hmm. Um, and at the end of the day, um, ensuring that your people leader or the people on the team who have people responsibilities have insight into where the business is moving, the strategic objectives, and they have insight into the performance of the business, truly is the best way to ensure that you are not overspending or Mm -hmm. spending on the wrong things. Because people programs can not only be costly, but they can take a long time to implement. And it also can set expectations with employees that this new thing is coming. And so if all of a sudden all this time and energy is put into this program that then has to be paired back, if the people who have made that decision to pair it back or to make that change Mm -hmm. don't have insight into, you know, why are we pulling this back other than we don't have money, Mm -hmm. um, it's going to be harder for you to retain people and it's ultimately really going to erode trust. And listen, there has been a pretty significant shift in I would say the not only the market, but the HR space in the last eight months, where many businesses who were in this growth stage and this exciting, right. you know, all great endless all, opportunity, you know, yeah. exactly. And, you know, really seeing businesses prioritize EDI and prioritize people programs and HR leaders having a true budget for the first time. I wouldn't say that's all been stripped away, but... Uh, similarly to the way that uh, the market is saying, you know, um, what is profit compared to growth? Um, you know, ha- what what point are you breaking even compared to when are you double down, uh, doubling down and scaling again? Mm-hmm. Um, HR programs and initiatives are very much in the spotlight right now mm-hmm. because businesses have that added pressure Um in order to understand profitability instead of growth. We saw a lot of investment um, in, uh, in, you know, the venture space Mm -hmm. through 2021 into 2022. A lot of that has changed. So as HR leaders 
we all, and whether you're a peop, HR leader or a people leader, mm -hmm. um, the shift has happened away from, okay, grow and, you know, the sky is the limit into evaluating what you're actually spending money on and being able to say, here's what it's driving. Here's the impact that it's having. And mm -hmm. here's how it's, you know, creating engagement and that employee experience that matches where the business is at. Yeah. And I, and I mean, from, from my perspective, I'm, I'm an accountant, right? So then I just <laughs> love getting actual metrics on, on things, right? So like, I think for, for our own firm and, and some of the things we suggest to, to clients often is that once you get those metrics of like actual turnover, you can kind of compare that to industry average, or you can kind of see seniority profiles or headcount mm -hmm. history and salary reports and diversity mix, like, and, and even just time it takes to actually fill a position. And then once you have these metrics, you can kind of make decisions based on these metrics, right? Like, but if you don't mm -hmm. actually track that, so if you don't have an HRIS that actually tracks that, it makes it so much harder to make decisions that will ensure profitability or that will ensure mm -hmm. clients are happy. Um, and so that's just from my own kind of experience. Yeah, it's a great point. And I think a very easy trap to fall into when it comes to people metrics mm. is overextending what you're measuring. So what do I mean by that? I could yeah. rhyme off 15 different HR metrics and I get asked all okay. the time, Andrea, what HR metrics do you measure? <laughs> yeah. Measuring something, and again, it's easy when you have an HRIS that does this for you, but the difference between measuring and having access to the data compared to actually prioritizing, measuring the right things mm -hmm. um, is pretty significant. And so mm -hmm. as an example, yeah. when Humi was scaling and going from 60 employees to 120 employees between mm -hmm. 2021 to 2022, mm -hmm. I was not looking at... Um, I was not looking at, you know, program participation rates and I was not looking at, um, you know, the percentage of people who were going through training before being promoted in the same lens that I was looking at time to hire, um, the open vacancies, right. the satisfaction ratings for people through the interview process because we were in a scaling stage. Mm hmm. Compare that, that to, yeah. that was the focus. So yes, you could in theory measure, again, 15 different things right. where the business was at, the recruiting metrics really were at the forefront because of what the business was doing at that time. Mm -hmm. And so my advice to any business um, is when it comes to HR metrics is to understand what the business is doing first and choose less metrics at the outset in, in order to measure because right. you need to create that benchmark. Otherwise mm -hmm. you're doing frankly busy work. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And like the, you can get some false positives on metrics that don't even matter, you know, or whatever, and then it'll, it'll be distracting. Mm -hmm. um, and in a situation where the company is doubling in size, mm -hmm. of course your, your, your satisfaction data is not really going to be authentic until you have you know, a quarter, half a year or a year with yeah. that stable employee base. Right. Yeah. No, that makes sense. Um, mm -hmm. And I guess like so far we've kind of talked about just, you know, industry and some good advice. And honestly, there's been some great content so far, but let's get into you. Let's, get, let's talk about you and your own personal kind of like things. And, and it's like something that comes to mind with HR is, is sometimes the emotional roller coaster that comes with dealing with various issues, um, you know, the satisfaction of growing a team, the fears, the, and all kinds of like life-changing moments that you are a part of when you're a people leader. And so personally, mm -hmm. how have you kind of managed that emotional kind of roller coaster for your work in the HR industry? Mm -hmm. Um, I think if I say unprecedented times, every <laughs> HR or people leader is going to roll their eyes. Um, for me, I was finding that as we were navigating, honestly, things that no business leader, let alone HR leader, has ever had to navigate, I distinctly remember this moment going to an employment lawyer who is fabulous, and they said, we've never dealt with this before. This is unprecedented. There's mm -hmm. not legal precedent on this. And I remember thinking, okay, 
So you really are in a lot of ways on your own, figuring it out, especially through the course of the pandemic. Yeah. Um, I have been lucky that I've been able to lean on an HR community. So mm. that is number one. Okay. I cannot stress enough the importance of having a community, whether it's internally at work or whether it's people that you have worked with over time. Um, that was very impactful to me. I think that new people managers and people leaders often have this mentality that, you know, you've been promoted, you have this responsibility, you have to have this illusion that you've you've got your your ducks in a row. You're a professional now. The expectation is that you know what you're doing. Mm -hmm. And so often we end up isolating or alienating ourselves and we forget how to ask for help. We forget, you know, to build that community. And so that is something that was really helpful for me, um, in, whether it was just sharing resources, whether it was venting, whether it was, you know, crisis management, uh, community really helped. Another thing that helped me uh, was actually something that my therapist shared. And I think, mm -hmm. you know, lots of HR professionals and people leaders can definitely benefit from a therapist if they don't already have one, mm -hmm. is the saying, learn how to care without carrying. Uh, you mentioned the emotional yeah. roller coaster and just the volatility, and especially in a growing business, a venture backed startup. Um, you know, you look at the tech sector and what's happened there um, over the last 12 months and how much that has changed. It is challenging at times to understand that you may be, whether you are the ultimate decision maker or you are the executioner of the decisions, um, it can be personally really challenging and cause a lot of internal turmoil when you care about people and you go into this field because you care about people and mm -hmm. you still have to make these tough decisions. And yeah. so learning how to care without bringing that home, you know, after work without bringing that into my personal relationships um, was something that took a lot of time and took me learning how to set better boundaries um, because I think oftentimes people leaders in the HR space lean into, you know, the, the empathetic, the want to solve right. problems, the want to do the listening, um, the active listening, and then you end up absorbing these emotions. Mm -hmm. um, and HR professionals, unless you are a trained therapist, you are not therapists, but oftentimes folks don't have anywhere else to go. And so bring and dump emotions and sometimes personal turmoil onto their people leaders. Yeah. I think, I think that's some really deep insight that uh, a lot of business owners should, should carry of, you know, kind of caring without carrying, you know, mm -hmm. I think that's, uh, that's huge. And, and you talked about kind of COVID and, and going through COVID, um, uh, you, you decided to do an MBA. Um, so mo <laughs> most people are trying to figure out, you know, how to survive. They're huddling in and you're out here doubling up, upping your skills. Uh, what was that like? <laughs> Uh, that was unique. I would definitely give a shout out to the Ted Rogers program for the fast pivot, like uh, many of us had to from, mm. you know, in-person learning to uh, remote learning. Um, I personally did and chose to do my MBA because I think HR as a field still in a lot of ways feels like that squeaky wheel uh, mm -hmm. A lot of HR professionals are not confident in the ability to understand both metrics, financial information, business performance. And my, you know, philosophy is that I think that businesses should care uh, the, about their employee experience the same way that they care about their customer journey. And in order to really be able to make that business case, you have to understand the business. And so as a person, I always look at things from a people lens. But as a business partner, I knew that I needed to really enhance my skill set at uh, a more sophisticated level in order to be able to prove that I understand both the business and the people side in order to create uh, in, in order to create that impact. And so I really enjoyed that experience. It was tough. Uh, it's mm -hmm. it's definitely a grind to be doing school and working full time, especially yeah. at a startup that's scaling. Yeah. Um, a fun little anecdote. I actually had both of my vaccines 
in the same um, in the same room within the Daphne Coxwell building yeah. um, of uh, of t- uh, the TMU campus. Okay. So I had both vaccines in wow. the same room as where my final class was, which was in person <laughs> after COVID. So what? it, uh, yeah. I, I had this full circle. Honest, you know, I had yeah. this full circle moment where I thought, wow, just the way in which humanity responds, um, and the way that we can adapt. Yeah. You know, a year ago, this people were in hazmat suits, <laughs> and it, this was, you know, a pretty alarming place to be. And now yeah. here I am sitting in a lecture with my classmates and my professor learning about big data. Um, so yeah. it was uh, it was a very full circle moment for me. Wow. And yeah, just adapting to change and just mm-hmm. having new things, right? And and so I guess for you, like what's what's next for you? What's what's kind of the next big challenge for you? Mm-hmm. Yeah, I'm I'm really at this exciting stage um, of my career where I feel like I've worked across a lot of different industries. I've worked with some phenomenal leaders. Um, I have been blessed by having really standout mentors as well. And that is something that I cannot stress enough is having somebody who is a sponsor. You read about it and you see it on Instagram, you know, surround Mm -hmm. yourself with people that, you know, say your name um, in the room when you're not there and, you know, speak Mm. positively. I have had that and it's been pretty transformative in my career. I'm a builder by nature and I will always want to be building, uh, whether it's for a company or for myself. Um, I do um, support small businesses um, through uh, my business called Today in HR. Um, And so I work across different industries with um, small businesses that often don't have any sort of HR presence um, and work with them to understand both their needs and where uh, where we can make impact. Um, And so that's been really exciting. Uh, I love that kind of work. Um, And like I said, I I love I love the HR space and I love building. So it's uh, it's an exciting uh, place for me to be in in my career. And I'm really lucky to be doing what I'm doing. Yeah. I, I feel like there's probably so much need for for some help on the HR front uh, for for scaling companies, small companies. And yeah, I think it's I think there's a huge opportunity there. Um, and mm-hmm. I guess we're running out of time here. But did was there anything else that you think that our, our listeners should know more about or that we missed uh, or maybe any podcasts that you listen to that you think are interesting for people to know? Yeah, um, my favorite podcast uh, she is an executive coach, Muriel Wilkins. It's called uh, Learning from Leaders by HBR. Okay. Uh, I listen to that um, pretty rigorously. Nice. And whether it's, you know, uh, an example or story that you can personally relate to, mm-hmm. um, I think that it is just such good content from an executive coach who works across all industries with all stages of leaders. Mm. Um, and so... Again, um, I'm a big believer that if you are the smartest person in the room, then you're in the wrong room. And I just love <laughs> learning. Yeah. Um, and that podcast uh, is is a great way to learn from other leaders, as the name Sweet. says. Okay. Yeah, we'll put the podcast in the uh, show notes so that uh, people can can check it out. Um, and if they uh, wanted to reach out to you, if anybody wants to, to reach out to you, should they just kind of follow you on LinkedIn or Twitter? Yeah. Like, what's the best way to reach you? Yeah, is it even called Twitter anymore? <laughs> oh, that's true. Yeah, I don't know. X. I guess X. it's not Twitter. We'll have to edit that. Yeah. <laughs> um, the easiest way to get a hold of me is on my LinkedIn profile, and I'm pretty quick to respond there. Okay. Okay. Sweet. Yeah. Okay. Awesome. Well, thanks so much for your time today. I think there's so much value in in this conversation. I feel like we could carry on and on and on about HR <laughs> and 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 the value you're bringing here. So again, thank you so much. Um, and and I hope we uh, run into each other again. Fabulous. Thanks for having me, Eric. Yeah. Thanks, Andrea. Take care. This episode is brought to you in part by MDASH. MDASH is an agency helping good people be heard. They help progressives and only progressives reach their audiences through strategy, design, and content. Whether you're building a communications plan or designing a new brand, MDASH is your partner in progress because your story deserves to be told. Check out their new podcast, Ampersand, and visit m-agency.ca 
for a sample of their great work. Both are linked in the episode notes. On our next episode, we've got Ange McCabe, who's a leader in performance coaching. She works a lot with emotional intelligence and shows us some tricks to develop your leaders in your small business. Follow now on your podcast provider of choice to get notified of that episode and more. Don't forget to rate and review this episode. Thanks.